Switching lesions now, here's a lady who runs three miles a day. So we can be pretty sure she's asymptomatic. She checks her time, she knows her exercise tolerance. <clears throat> it hasn't changed. Her physician, uh, she's normotensive, her physician hears a uh, holosystolic murmur. A third heart sound, which in mitral regurgitation is a sign not of heart failure necessarily, but an indicator of all the blood that's been stored in the left atrium during systole that plops down into the ventricle during diastole and makes an S3. It's a, a sign of severity rather than necessarily a sign of heart failure. Goes off to the echo lab where she's got uh, a, a, an enlarged but not huge heart, a preserved ejection fraction, bileaflet mitral valve prolapse, Severe mitral regurgitation with an effective regurgitant orifice of 0.42, that's a very large hole. And by anyone's criteria then, she has severe asymptomatic mitral regurgitation. And the question is what to do with her. One strategy, oh, I, these, were the, these were our definitions, I actually wrote this part of the guidelines, of what, what severe MR is, as you see that, that this effective regurgitant orifice area of greater than 0.4 square centimeters is a big hole. Um, she, and so one strategy for treating her is to is watch for waiting. Okay, so what are you gonna watch and wait for? You watch and wait for the onset of symptoms, for the beginning of left ventricular dysfunction, and although in the 2006 guidelines it was a 2A indication, <coughs> I actually am going to press for the, <coughs> pardon me, the onset of pulmonary hypertension to be a 1. Pulmonary hypertension is a curse. And once your patient with mitral disease develops, that their prognosis changes. And, I, and, I, and it, it, it is a 1 on the other side of the ocean. <coughs> Symptoms are key in every valve disease. Ejection fraction tells you just one thing. Symptoms are an amalgamation of systolic function, diastolic dysfunction, filling pressures, left atrial compliance, coronary blood flow, lymphatic return from the lungs, and things we can't even measure, which is why when Trebouille and colleagues looked at this, even for patients with mitral regurgitation whose ejection fraction was preserved, if they entered the operating room having developed severe symptoms, their prognosis was much worse. Symptoms had tipped the equation. So even if their heart looks okay on echo, you cannot ignore your patient with valve disease developing symptoms. It is a bad prognostic sign. And so it's an important key in terms of when you should intervene. Ejection fraction is important. And Marie Serrano, looking at this, if the patient enters the operating room with an EF of greater than 60, they'll do better than if they enter the operating room with an ejection fraction of less than 60. Remember that in mitral regurgitation, all that volume stretches the sarcomeres, increases preload, and revs up the ventricle for ejection so that the normal EF in somebody with mitral regurgitation is about 65 or 70 percent. And by the time it gets to be less than 60, you've got a shot ventricle. And that's, you pass the golden moment, which is why we made the recommendation to get them to the OR before the EF falls to less than 60. Or if you want your patient with MR to leave the operating room and return to a normal ejection fraction postoperatively, it's important that they're in systolic dimension. How far the heart comes down when it's done contracting. That the end systolic dimension be less than 40 preoperatively if you want postoperatively for them to return to a normal ejection fraction. So those are the three things in the guidelines. Just three things to remember. You send your patient with severe MR for a procedure. If they develop symptoms, if their EFB is trending down towards less than 60, or if their end systolic dimension is growing towards 40. And Raphael Rosenheck did that, just that. The guidelines on, from the uh, um, European Society of Cardiology and our guidelines are virtually identical. And so in Vienna, he took 128 patients with MR and watched and waited until they developed one of those triggers 
and then sent them to surgery, and their survivorship was identical to an age-matched population, this gray line. Watchful waiting appeared to work. So then along comes this study by Kang and colleagues, 447, uh, 447 patients with severe asymptomatic MR. 161 of those patients were operated early and wait for those triggers. They got surgery before any of those things happened. The other 286 underwent the watchful waiting strategy. And in that study, it appeared that early surgery was superior to watchful waiting. So now I've given you two virtually opposite conclusions. In one case, that watchful waiting is a perfectly good strategy and works. And in the other case, early surgery appears to be better. How do you reconcile those two virtually opposite points of view? First of all, neither of these was a randomized controlled trial, and surgeons don't operate on people they think they're going to kill. So there was something about those 161 patients that made them very good operative candidates. Zero is like really low as far as mortality and, and may not be necessarily duplicatable. But the key is here. Six patients in the conventional group refused surgery. They condemned themselves to a bad outcome, and that couldn't have happened in the operative group. They were already operated. So it may not be so hard to reconcile the two studies, but most importantly, most importantly, in the Rosenheck series, in five years, virtually half the patients had met an endpoint. So we used to say that regurgitation was well tolerated. One of the regurgitation lesions is, and it ain't this one. Microregurgitation is poorly tolerated. Your patient will reach an endpoint at the rate of about 8% per year, so that if a patient with severe MR enters your office, within six years, it is likely that they're going to need an operation. And that's why we in the guidelines say that, sound, that waiting is, watchful waiting is a sound strategy, but you're not going to get to watch or wait for as long as you thought you might, and therefore, we moved from the 98 guidelines from a 2B to, the, to a 2A in 2006. That is, in, in, in 98, we said some people would. In 2006, we said most people would operate on the asymptomatic patient with severe mitral regurgitation who had perfectly normal LV function if you were certain, nearly certain, that you could get this valve repaired. That's the key. That's the game changer. Repair means your patient will leave the operating room with his or her native valve preserved, no prosthetic device, no risk of prosthetic failure, no warfarin. Uh, and the, it, it's like what I, I call this an ASD analogy. You have a patient with atrial septum defects, you just go get them fixed. So the operative mortality is quite low and the results are quite good. And, and if you look at this um, data from the Mayo Clinic, patients undergoing repair essentially have a normal lifespan, no, no different than a, a group of patients that never had mitral disease. There never will be a randomized trial of repair versus replacement, but every series that's out there shows exactly this, that the operative mortality of replacement is about four times the operative mortality of repair. So if I can get my lady's valve repaired, I might do it now. Here's the hooker. Um, I'd like to do it, but when Steve Bowling looked at the STS database, which encompasses 75% of all the operations done in America, he found that the average repair per surgeon was 41%. And the median number of op mitral operations per surgeon was five, five a year. Now, how good a, a golf game would you have if you only played golf five times a year? So if you're going to practice that 2A strategy of early repair, you have to send your patient to a repair surgeon. 
And there are surgeons in this country that do almost nothing but mitral valve repair and have a 98% repair rate. But you can't practice, one size does not fit all. You can't practice this ASD analogy, this 2A strategy, without knowing the repair rate of the surgeon to whom you report. Because if my patient leaves the OR with a prosthetic device, I've really done her a terrible disservice. I've committed her to prosthetic valve disease instead of a repair. I have to know if this valve, looking at the transesophageal echocardiogram along with the surgeon, that we feel that this valve could be repaired. Switching gears, 75-year-old man has had three myocardial infarctions. He's in class three heart failure. He's got an ejection fraction of 22%, and he has severe mitral regurgitation. He's got far advanced functional MR. So organic versus secondary MR, primary versus secondary MR sound a lot alike. But then so do tonsillectomy and orchiectomy. <laughs> Very different operations, and these two diseases are that different. They unfortunately employ the two words mitral regurgitation that makes them sound similar. But in organic MR, primary MR, it's the valve that makes the heart sick. It is that persistent volume overload, that hemodynamic burden of every beat on the left ventricle that causes, at least in, the, in, 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 in my laboratory, histology to change from normal to a 35% loss of contractile elements after six months. And it can all come back to normal after a successful mitral valve repair. Koch's postulates, the disease caused the problem and fixing the disease makes it go away. Very simple concept, it works. It's an enormous temptation to transpose this to functional MR, but they're opposite in functional MR. It's the heart that made the valve sick. There's nothing wrong with this guy's valve. It is those, all those myocardial infarctions and the regional wall motion abnormalities that cause dyssynchrony of the papillary muscles, dilatation of the ventricle that pulls the papillary muscles apart and causes the LV annulus to dilate that cause the mitral regurgitation. Now we know that MR in functional MR is associated with a worse prognosis. So here's heart failure without MR. And here's heart failure with a little MR. And here's heart failure with a lot of MR. And one way to interpret those data is you say, look, even a little MR is bad for you. But we don't know that. We don't know that the MR is the cause of that. Another way of looking at this is that it is the MR which is simply reporting to you how bad the ventricle is. The worse the MR, the worse the ventricle. Like a fever in sepsis, none of you would think that giving Tylenol to a septic patient would cure their disease. You might bring the fever down. And likewise, it may be that the MR is just telling you how shot the left ventricle is. Because if the MR is the cause of this worsened prognosis, if MR is the, is the cause, it should be relatively easy to prove because fixing it ought to make you feel better and live longer. And we've never been able to do that. Uh, Bach and Bowling demonstrated you could operate on these patients. And he had a group of, of 100 patients with an EF of 17%. Operative mortality was only a couple of percent. And a year later, their ejection fractions had gone up a little bit. Their cardiac outputs have gone up a little bit. They appeared to be better. So he proved you could operate. The next question is, should you and in whom? Does surgery for functional MR, functional MR, improve survival? Well, Harris and colleagues couldn't demonstrate that. Here are two groups of patients with functional MR, one group undergoing just bypass surgery, the other group undergoing bypass surgery plus a mitral valve operation, and they didn't seem to do any better. Here's Bowling's own data. Those patients treated medically versus patients in whom he operated. There was no advantage operative, and this, these were propensity, not, these are not randomized data. We do not 
have a randomized controlled trial of mitral valve surgery in functional MR, but in a propensity matched analysis, there was no difference. From the Cleveland Clinic, these are patients with the functional MR that underwent just bypass versus bypass plus a mitral valve operation. There was no difference. And when Benedetto and colleagues did a, a meta-analysis of everything that's out there, he could find no improvement in survival nor even an improvement in symptoms by treating functional MR. That's not to say that it doesn't work in some patients. And I don't want you to leave here thinking that I said don't ever operate on this group. The problem is we just don't know upon whom to operate. Some get better, some don't, but as a group, we've not been able to demonstrate the kind of success we've been able to demonstrate with other valve disease because this isn't really valve disease. This is ventricular disease causing the valve to leak. So the, in primary or uh, organic MR, the therapeutic bar is quite high. You do a successful mitral valve repair on the patient with organic MR, they're likely to live a normal lifespan free of warfarin, free of any complications, they do great. The functional bar for, I mean, for functional MR, the therapeutic bar is quite low. We don't know what to do with them, which is why percutaneous devices like the mitral clip, which can be put in and, and used to snare these two leaflets and bring them together, uh, may work pretty well for functional MR. We know that it's a safe device and if you look at the freedom from death in this random, this is a randomized trial, Everest II, surgery and the clip device had equal safety. The clip does not work as well in repairing MR as surgery does, no surprise. Surgeons doing a plastic, beautiful repair, this is just a clip. So, it, but in, in Europe where, the, where this clip has been available for use for two and a half years, most of the time it's being used to treat functional mitral regurgitation. Whether it will be released in this country or not, I have no idea. It currently is only an experimental device. Switching lesions, switching valves. A 45-year-old man runs three miles a day. He's asymptomatic. He has severe aortic regurgitation uh, by echocardiogram. Ventricle is dilating a bit. And the question is what to do with him. Should we fix him? I said, we probably should fix my lady with mitral regurgitation. What about doing it for him? Well, first of all, this valve is not usually repairable. That's the difference. If I go to, to, to treat this patient mechanically, 90% chance that he's going to get a prosthetic device. And if I, he's 45, if I put a mechanical valve in him, there's a 1% to 2% risk of either the hemorrhagic complications of warfarin or a thromboembolic complication from the valve. So he's 45, if he lives to be 75, there's a 60% chance that he's gonna have a serious complication from that mechanical valve. If I put in a bioprosthesis, you all know that the earlier age at which a bioprosthesis is placed determines its deterioration. The younger the patient, the sooner a bioprosthesis deteriorates, and he's here. He's these open circles. If I put a bioprosthesis in this guy, there is a 50% chance that by the time he's 55, he's going to need another valve. And the natural history of AR is much different than the natural history of, of MR. So far, we don't know if either of these things would affect AR. They haven't been tried. But the natural history of AR is a decrement reaching an endpoint of symptoms or LV dysfunction of 4% per year. Remember, it was 8% per year in MR. It's half that for AR, so that within 10 years from now, there's still a 60% chance that he'll be okay. So I'm not propelled to do anything for this guy. I've got to put it, I'm almost certainly going to put in a prosthetic device that has all of those risks of complications in a patient that's likely to do very well for the next 10 years. Now, the triggers are the same, symptoms or LV dysfunction, so that when Elizabeth Clotus looked at this, on your left are people with AR and preserved LV function, but once again, even with a normal ejection fraction, if they've developed significant symptoms, 
before you operate, it impacts on surgery. So anything more than class two symptoms are an indication to go to the OR. Ejection fraction is important. You want them to go to the OR before the EF gets to be less than 50% because that does impact on prognosis. And you want them to get to the OR before the ventricle can no longer contract to 55 millimeters because then outcome is impacted. Now, this is a disease of afterload. This great big ventricle operating at high pressure has as high afterload in it as aortic stenosis does, typical pressure overload, which raises the issue maybe we could reduce afterload medically and have an impact. And uh, if you look at what happens surgically, even in people with very low ejection fractions preoperatively, postoperatively afterload goes down and ejection fraction goes up. So those kinds of data tempt us to use afterload reduction in our patient with AR. And Sconomilio did that. Sconomilio and colleagues randomized patients with AR, asymptomatic normal LV function, either received nifedipine or a pseudo placebo, digoxin. And it appeared that nifedipine forestalled the need for surgery by two or three years. And in the 98 guidelines, we were so happy that we had a randomized trial of anything that we made it a one to put your patient with aortic insufficiency on a vasodilator. 10 years later, Evangelista and colleagues does the same study this time using a real placebo instead of digoxin and employing a third arm of enalapril. Well, there was no benefit to the nifedipine and the enalapril actually looked worse. So virtually opposite conclusions, one where vasodilators seemed to be a good idea and the other one where it didn't work. Uh, the difference may be this. In the sconomelial trial, the blood pressure was 30 points higher than in the Evangelista trial. It may be that Sconomilio and colleagues were just treating high blood pressure. So we went from a 1 in 98 to a 2B in 2006 because the data now were conflicting and we didn't know what to do. Actually, if the, the, the guidelines for valve disease, as proud as I am to have been an author of them, are a lot like sausage. If you saw how people made it, you would never eat it. And uh, that's kind of, with the few data that we've got, it's a real struggle to write these guidelines. So what to do with him? Uh, I'm in no hurry. He, 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 I'm not anxious to replace a valve in a 45-year-old guy that's very likely to last another 10 years. So comparing these two regurgitant lesions, tolerability for MR is short. There's a likelihood of reaching an endpoint within just six years. Whereas for AR, it's twice that. It's a much better tolerated lesion. In neither case have we proven that drugs work. In MR, we're likely to be able to repair the valve, sending the patient home with a native valve as opposed to AR where we're stuck replacing the valve, incurring all of the risks of a prosthetic device. In every valve disease, the presence of symptoms are bad, you should not wait once the patient develops symptoms. The cutoffs are different because the loading conditions are different. So surgery has improved a lot over the last 50 years and it allows us to think about earlier surgery, especially with mitral valve repair, where we wouldn't have thought about it before. And it also allows us to operate safely on patients that once would have been considered inoperable. Again, these percutaneous devices are gonna come along and let's not let the genie out of the bottle again as we did for coronary disease. Let's listen to the data and practice accordingly as these devices become developed. They're gonna be a part of your practice. They're not gonna go away. They're gonna get better and they're gonna be more of them. And we're gonna to have to learn what their proper role is in the treatment of our patients with valvular heart disease.